Uh, good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sorry for the wait. Who knew that taking 40 Benadryl could take you to the nightmare dimension for about a whole year? Well, here I am, back doing what I love. What? Animating? Hell no, what we'll give you that idea, stupid fucking idiot dumbass? I love FNAF fan games. This community is full of creative minds who put all their time and effort in creating gaming experiences who, with some dedication, can even be better than the official games themselves. From what I've seen, this community has never disappointed me and- Dormitibus is a disgusting, vile game made by an alleged pedophile that crashed on me over 10 times across the course of my entire playthrough. Had crucial assets for gameplay failed to load in more times than I can count, had animatronic mechanics just straight up break on multiple occasions, and was genuinely one of the most miserable experiences I've ever had with a FNAF game in my entire life. Yeah, okay, fine. I may have been lying about a few things. I hate to admit it, but when I was younger, my favorite FNAF fan game was Dermidibus. Uh, don't get me wrong, the main reason was because I didn't know English, and so the story of the game just kind of completely went over my head. I just really liked the visuals. FNAF 3 was always my favorite FNAF game, so the animatronic designs were just unique. But as an adult, however, my opinion is more like, oh, What the fuck? What the fuck? The creator did what? Garvey did what to a child? But then, the light at the end of the tunnel, like that one gif of fucking mercy from Overwatch, or Midibus Remastered, a game that aimed not only to fix the previous game, but to completely rewrite the story and update the worst parts of the original. And hey, if it was any good, maybe I could finally have the Dermidibus I thought I experienced as a child. So you know what? That's what we're gonna do here today. Go night by night and give an analysis on the new Dermidibus, and hopefully come out of this experience with a positive outlook not only on the game itself, but how a community can come together and create something better out of a really, really bad situation. Let's begin. As we start night one, we get shown video footage of someone being stuffed in a dumpster behind some pizzeria. You know, the standard lore stuff for FNAF fan games. Then we get shown 12 nights earlier and get transported into the actual night itself. As we get welcomed into our new office, we hear the first part of the lore by our new, still a bit awkward but much better than the original, phone guy. And I'll, I'll just let you hear what he has to say for yourself. Huh. I'm gonna actually open the connection. Uh, uh, hello? My name is Peter, and I was a manager for Freddy's back in 1993. I'm not sure how you died, but maybe something happened. Wait, wait. It can't be. John? Christ, that would explain why everything looks worse. If you died by burning, that, then that means he's gonna be here soon. Uh oh, I almost forgot. Since you fucked things up by dying, I've been working on a short plan as we speak. There's there is a tape in the office. Grab it and play it once Bray sleeps. There's some things you need to remember. I also have my own set of tapes to collect, so I better get to finding them now. We'll talk later. Basically, we play as John, and apparently we were the same protagonist as the security guard from FNAF 3, which of course means we were burnt alive with the rest of the pizzeria. The place we are in now is basically purgatory, where everyone that has died inside of Freddy's goes into, including of course the he we are introduced to, which we can obviously assume is the purple guy. In this night, our only enemy is Havoc Freddy, which is real easy to deal with. In fact, you can basically skip the entire first night by sitting on one side of the office and just sitting there. This may seem like a negative, but I actually think this is a pretty smart way to introduce players to the new setting. Believe me, knowing the layout of your office, and especially the numbers of each camera, will be very useful when you have to deal with certain animatronics from later nights. 
This was also done in the original FNAF 3, where the first night had literally no animatronics so you could learn the layout of the pizzeria properly. Here, they seem to follow the same general gameplay philosophy, but add the element of Havoc Freddy into the mix, which of course makes it so there's at least something there for you to deal with. The threat of Havoc Freddy also shows the player the main mechanic of the game, the glass window behind you, where he can sometimes appear before he reaches your office, and running to the other side of the table, which is exactly what you do to deal with Havoc Freddy. Once you reach the other side, you'll almost immediately hear the footsteps of him leaving. Again, I did say this was the easiest animatronic to deal with. The real challenge comes from you having to deal with him and a lot of other animatronics at the same time. The phone guy also explains that there are various tapes hidden in both your office and on the cameras which you do need to pick up every night. If you've seen the original Dermidibus, you know that these tapes are the most recognizable part of the game. For all the horrible wrong reasons, but we'll get into that later when we have all the tapes. For now, we survive from 10pm to 6am and get ready for night 2. In night 2, you have to deal with two animatronics, Havoc Chica and Am I Real. Remember when I told you to pay attention to the camera numbers on night 1? Well, Am I Real's mechanic is that you have to press the number of the camera he's in and stare at him until he looks clean. You'll know which camera he's in because he actually just says it. Again, this mechanic is pretty easy to deal with, but it's actually one of the hardest parts of the game in later nights. This is because you gotta listen to his voice lines with all the other animatronics doing noise, and also trying to keep the camera steady while other threats are trying to keep you moving and distracted. He's definitely the most active one this night. So active, in fact, that you have to deal with him while you're listening to the phone guy, so uh, yeah, I'll just let you hear the lore now while you see Am I Real in action. Now, you might be wondering why they're all after you when you probably didn't do anything to them. Well, let's just say they see you as sort of a fix, everything McGuffin for their own damned souls. You and I have this source known as Plasma because we died, which makes them want to kill us again. But unlike us, they've they've been corrupted. They're in pain, John, and they want to be free. That's why they're after you. They only want to fix their damaged souls. Uh, um. Anyway, you got some newer problems to deal with. With, with that all the way, you're you're all set for tonight. I'm still planning, so I'll let you know when I think of something, John. Havoc Chica is basically a slightly more difficult version of Havoc Freddy. Basically, when she reaches your right door, you have to run to the other side and stare at her until she leaves. Then, after she's gone, you need to quickly get back to your PC so the cupcake doesn't jump scare you instead. One thing that's very notable about Havoc Chica is the distinct noise she makes when she reaches your office. I cannot stress enough how on later nights you will not have time to look at her and to check who's there, so recognizing your specific sound is basically required. As you heard before, the phone guy tells us that we are made of this material called plasma, which to be honest is just like the remnant equivalent of this game. Basically, all the animatronics want our plasma because that could apparently allow them to leave. Whatever the case is, we have to deal with them every night as we collect the tapes. 
You may have realized something. Hey, where's Havoc Freddy this night? The answer is that he isn't here. Instead of piling on different animatronics every night, this game chooses to only have certain animatronics of its cast active each night, which honestly, I absolutely love. This means that, for example, Night 9 and Night 10 will play a lot differently from each other, and they aren't just a harder version of the previous night. Once again, we fend off the threads, collect the tape, and finish the second night of the game. Hey, I'm back man. Things are really starting to speed up now, so I'll try to explain things faster for you. Night 3 is when things start to get real. This night introduces us to three new animatronics all at once. Havoc Bonnie, Soul Cage, and Dawnbreaker. Returning from the previous night are Havoc Freddy and Am I Real. Havoc Bonnie is the most similar to what we've seen before appearing on the left door, but this time, instead of running away, you need to stare at him until he leaves. Just like Chica, Bonnie has a specific sound he uses during the night. He first makes noise on the right door before tricking you and going to the left. This can be disorientating, especially when other animatronics are active. He goes and he'll get up. I'm still working on something to think of to help get out. Uh, until then, good luck, John. Soul Cage is one of my favorite designs from the game. He's made out of a bunch of props. It appears on the right door and jump scares you before moving onto the ceiling. When he's up there, you have to stare at him until he disappears as the music slowly builds up. Small legs, or whatever those are. Almost like it's a soul cage. It's It'll try to scare you to death, so just, just look up afterward and be It genuinely is one of my favorite designs from the game. I guess it's a good time to talk about the redesigns. The remaster improves every design, from small changes for the sake of updating the quality, to complete redesigns of animatronics and locations. Of course, some animatronics still look a bit weird, but this is more a fault of the original source material than the remaster itself. Getting back on track, we have Dawnbreaker. There's not much to say about him. He's more of a cool final challenge than an actual character. Whenever you beat the night and reach 6am, all the animatronics will disappear from the map, leaving you alone with Dawnbreaker. You get rid of it by looking everywhere in your office, and then, once you find it, stare at it until it disappears. It's not much of a challenge, but it did get me at least once in my gameplay because I just forgot he can't appear on the cameras. Yeah, not my brightest moment, is it? Anyways, when it comes to Phone Guy, he doesn't really say much this night. He simply tells us the information about the animatronics and not much else. He does mention that things are starting to speed up, almost like all the animatronics are acting different in preparation for someone's arrival. Night 3 is great because it's where the game starts to pick up in difficulty. You're no longer dealing with a couple animatronics every night and start having to think of how they all play together in order to deal with every issue all at once. We grab the tape, stare at the ceiling a couple of times, and we are on our way. Just be careful with Dawnbreaker. Start looking. When I hit six, it's bam, 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 bam. Good evening, John, or whatever time it is. 
Okay, so I got some good news and some bad news for you, but I'll start off with the good news. Night 4 once again introduces three new animatronics to the mix, although two of them really only act as one. And this night you will have to deal with Havoc Puppet and the pair of Havoc, BB, and JJ. Returning this night we have Havoc Freddy, Havoc Chica, Soul Cage, and Dawnbreak. Let's start with Havoc Puppet as he's relatively simple. During the night, you will start hearing a music box, which means that Havoc Puppet is standing outside of your window. To deal with him, you simply look outside the window until he disappears. Havoc BB and JJ are unique, but also relatively simple. You see, to deal with them, you first need to stare at one by looking to the left, and then run across your table to deal with the other at the other side of the room. You could tell it's them at the door because they will do their classic annoying laugh. If you've played any FNAF games before, you already know what I'm talking about. And of course, they keep their annoying reputation because sometimes they'll just go around your window and make noise so you can't concentrate. I hate them so much. And that's why I love them. Ah, shit. Look, I gotta go. Oh, the fox is here. So if I don't hide myself, he might never let me speak to you again. Also, a fox. I guess we know what to expect for night five. Also, it seems like this night, Phone Guy found out something interesting. I'll let you hear what he has to say. Good news is, I finally found something to help us both with our escape. But the bad news is, some more of them are waking up. Remember how I told you to grab those tapes while I try to find my set? Turns out these tapes hold a secret for how to get out of here, and I already have all that I need. I just need to look them over again and start searching around. Maybe you'll have better luck than I do. Huh, so it seems the tapes are our key out of here. That's good to know. Anyway, let's just grab our tapes and continue to night five. There we go. Remember how I met Enchina Fox? He's helping out Am I Real, but I'm not sure why. <sighs> Alright, John, you probably don't know this yet, but I was stuffed inside a suit from the old Freddy location from 1984. You know, the one with the four missing children after Fred Bear's suit. It stayed open in 1993, if I recall. Well, there was another victim who was shoved in the same suit as me, from the looks of it. My remains are inside, but he was the one confronted by that puppet, unfortunately. Just look at the window and he should leave. So, Night 5 certainly introduces some weird new lore to the mix. From the people we've seen before, there's only Am I Real, Havoc Puppet, and Havoc BB and JJ. Hey, just wanted to say that there is an error here. You see, Soul Cage is active this night, it just doesn't show up on the night select for some reason. I'm pretty sure this glitch was fixed in a later version, but I played in a previous one, so, you know, forgive me, I guess. Uh, continue the video. Our two new animatronics are Havoc Foxy, which we were warned about last night, and Golden Call, which Phone Guy just told us is basically his corpse, but being controlled by another spirit in the same suit. I'll be honest, I really like the lore of this character, especially since if you look at its design, you can tell it's the same suit from the game over screen from FNAF 1. You know, it just helps flesh out the world in a cool way. Yes, I am aware this lore existed in the original Vermitibus, however, the original voice acting and story of that game really made it hard to take these characters seriously. Anyways, for his mechanic, he makes the classic FNAF 1 call sound from outside of your window. To deal with him, you stare at him until he leaves. Yeah. 
you may realize that this mechanic is the same as Havoc Puppets. Once again, this is one of those cases where you have to pay attention to the sounds, because both Golden Call and the Puppet can appear at the window at the same time, but only one of them will be visible, so you need to pay attention to the sounds to be able to deal with both of them. As for Havoc Foxy, he's pretty anxiety inducing. You can stare at him to delay his appearance, but once he's out he'll make a loud rising sound as he sprints to your office. You have to check the cameras to know which side he's running towards, and then quickly sprint to the other side of your office to stare at him as he enters. This can be very difficult to deal with in later nights, as you barely have enough time to deal with both Am I Real, Havoc Foxy, and another character that we'll see later, all at the same time. Can you tell I'm pretty bad at FNAF games? Other than that, the night plays similarly to the others. We get updated on the phone guy's progress, we deal with the threats, and collect the tape, and move on to the next night. About that plan, the tape I got mentioned how there is an old back room in the old Freddy's location. Supposedly, it's been there since Fred Fairs without anyone's knowledge. I'll try to find it and see if I can figure out where the clue lies. Oh, and about the kids, I did find a way to free them, but unfortunately, I wasn't fast enough to notice. There's a few things that will appear on your side. If you're lucky, you'll find them all in this place. Hopefully we can get out of here. With or without regrets. Talk to you later, I hope. Night 6 doesn't introduce much when it comes to new lore. Does, however, have one new animatronic for us to deal with. This night we have... Oh, oh god, that's a lot of names. Okay. <clears throat> Havoc Freddy, Havoc Chica, and my real soul cage. Dawnbreaker, Havoc Foxy, Golden Call, be away. Gotta catch him, gotta catch him all. They're all that kids. A anyways, the box of abominations, or just to be away, will appear on your right door. It doesn't really have a noise when it enters your office, but it does have a specific voice line it says when you're running to the other side. So once again, you stare at it, but it is one of the slower animatronics to leave your office. Again, you have to play around this in later nights. If you haven't noticed, BOA and Soul Cage are both made of various objects that you can find around the FNAF 3 office, be it the mannequins or the box of toy animatronics. Again, these are really cool details that help with the world building. It makes you think of how the only reason these two are even here is because the pizzeria of FNAF 3 burned down. Other than that, I really don't have much to say about this night. The phone call doesn't really tell us much, and the night itself is, while harder, pretty calm when it comes to lore heavy things. I guess you couldn't call this the calm before the storm. Let's hope the storm isn't close. Thank God for that. I have been uh, looking at the past six nights and noticed their behavior has changed sporadically. They're much more aggressive than usual now. That molten rabbit might have more control over them than expected, so you're kind of fucked, John. Since they're the one in control of this place, though, and it never goes well, so... I suppose we'll call them Molten Evil. 
good news is I found a key in the back room, so if I'm lucky, you'll be able to see it on your side, eventually. I just hope it doesn't go anywhere or disappear. Anyways, good luck, John. Night 7 has these animatronics. Yeah, no, I'm not doing the pokey rap again. This night also introduces us to Molten Evil. This game's rookish- Rook- Yeah, that's not happening. This game's Shadow Bonnie equivalent. From what the phone guy says, it seems like this is the thing keeping all the others here. I was pretty interested in this character, so I decided to look at the extras menu to get some character info. Yeah, the character info. I haven't really mentioned it until now, have I? Basically, every character in the game has an entry that you unlock after you beat the knight. This tells us some lore about the character, but mostly only their name and some cryptic description of what they represent. In most cases, we get the actual name of every victim. Jack for Foxy, Tom for the puppy, it, etc etc but for a couple of them it's a different story and molten evil is one of them one of the only things we know about molten evil is that they seem to represent and i quote a powerful vengeful neglector with her real name being hidden just by checking the length of the name we can tell it's two words one of them probably being right based on the last two letters We'll get into it later, but basically, Wright is the main family name of the game. My personal theory is that they are supposed to represent the neglectful parents of those who let their kids die at the pizzeria, probably taking form as the mother of the Wright family. But hey, that's just a theory! Well, no, we're not doing that. But for now, all that matters is their mechanic. Screen will start to glitch more and more, and when it does, you need to look up at the ceiling until it disappears. Yeah, pretty simple to deal with, but hey, the lore is more interesting than the character itself. Speaking of lore, the phone guy tells us that hey, he actually found a key out of here. Well, I hope he's right. Let's just get the tape and proceed to night 8. I got some good news. I found an extra pair of keys. We might both be able to make it out of here, after all. About time, too. This place can go to hell for all I care. I do have some bad news, I think. So, when I looked in the back room after buying it, I saw this large rabbit thing, and it looked... It looked really fucked up. I figured it was probably just a poor soul or something, so I left them in there. But now I think I made a mistake looking in there. I kept hearing them scream out at our name, including Alice. I'm, I'm afraid it might be Darcy. They're gonna break in soon, so if I'm lucky, you'll get a call from me. If not, well... I don't know. This is all my fault. I'm sorry, John. I, I really need to go now. Okay, so Night 8 has a lot of exposition, huh? Apparently, the phone guy found a second pair of keys, so uh, great, we can get out of here. But uh, what's that about the rabbit? Could that be Springtrap? Or I guess Scarvy? Uh, I think I should have listened to the tapes. Tapes, tapes. <laughs> This is Garvey Wright, and I guess I'm talking to my future self. Give some good use to this recorder Alex gave me. Everyone gave me things. I suppose it was my birthday. I want to help these people out. They went through all the effort of bringing me in, and it would only make sense that I help lighten the load around the house. So I'm thinking of entering the family business. Wish me luck. Good news, I got the job. Y you know that. Of course, you know that, because it's already happened to you, but... Look, I got the 
It's really simple, actually. Well, mostly simple. I still have to deal with the occasional rowdy youth. I hope I don't have to clean up nearly as much as I did for my first day for the next while. Some of them were picking on each other. It wasn't nice to watch. Peter helped me. He helped me get back there and I guess get back to reality. It's, uh, it's been a lie. Pay has been increasing by quite a bit, actually. Uh, apparently, being a janitor has its quirks, especially with John's birthday coming around soon. We're going to have to spend it in the establishment this time, which I know he's not the biggest fan. I can tell that he doesn't like the animatronics. I mean, I don't necessarily like them. Either. Hopefully this new rabbit that I'm helping fix up will lighten that up, I guess. Hopefully. I just want to make this birthday good for John. Better than it was for me, at least. I can see a lot of myself in him, you know? supposed to know I I couldn't have known that they would it was supposed to be his day it, it's all wrong fucking bear we should have we should have known it could wasn't safe It's those fuck. Uh, well, that was something. Anyways, this night introduces us to Springwitch, which is probably the most reworked character between the original and the remaster. If you remember, in the original game, Havoc Foxy and Golden Call used to team up, making you have to spell words on a window that would appear on your monitor. The problem was that these words were not only complicated, but also case sensitive, and the window that opened was hard to maneuver and to type into without constant glitches or other problems. The remake fixes this issue by just making the challenge completely different. Instead of all that mess, the game introduces us to Springwitch, a character who attacks by inputting code into your PC. To get rid of Springwitch, all you need to do is go to the cameras that correspond with the number combination. Throughout the video, I've said various times that you should pay attention to things like placement of the cameras and learn the layout of the map. Yeah, Springlitch is the main reason why. Think about it. Imagine having to deal with Cake Bear and look at Havoc Foxy, two characters that require constant camera usage while also darting across the map to finish Springlitch's code. This challenge is a lot fairer than the original, but it's still a complete night for those who enjoy a bit of suffering. In fact, it's such a challenge that Springlitch just does not return for night 9, which, spoiler alert, is the last normal night of the game. I've talked before how I genuinely enjoy how the game cycles its characters between nights, and this is no different. Springlitch is a unique challenge that makes it so night 8 and night 9 both feel like different final challenges but without ramping the difficulty between them, making the gameplay cycle just feel completely different. But I guess we should collect the tape. Do I really have to? 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 John. 
Um, I hope you receive this call. Uh, look, I'm absolutely done for. The keys, the spare keys were a fucking lie this whole damn time. I was screwed from the start, and I don't know what to do anymore. I'm sorry, John. I, I tried taking the old keys back, but they're gone. I don't know where I put them, so we were both screwed now. He's already torn them all apart, but the worst part? You've been one day behind from me. I don't even think I'm the same Peter you recognize. I don't even think I'm real anymore. Just, 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 just get the fuck out of this place, John. It's the best I can hope for. I just can't take this, and I won't let Darby have his satisfaction of killing me. I'm gonna hang up for good. Well, I guess this is goodbye, John. Phone guy. Huh. Well, there's not much to say about this other than HOLY SHIT! This night is basically the last and hardest version of the main gameplay loop. I could ramble on about each and every animatronic that appears during the night and tell you how much they all play off each other, but I think it's much more effective if I just show you the experience of playing Night 9. Without further ado, let's beat this! This is a really, really good gaming experience. I mean, it almost made me forget about the phone guy. Huh. I should probably listen to those tapes. But no, not again. I don't, don't want, want to see the lore of this game again. Not again! Okay, fine. I'll talk about them. Okay, so, the tapes. If you know the original Dermidibus, you know that the tapes are the worst part of the original, by far. If you don't know, the creator of the game was allegedly a pedophile and necrophile, and, well, his interests may have bled into the story of the game he was creating. Don't get me wrong, in the remake, the lore was completely changed. These elements do not exist anymore, but still, some parts of the story feel really awkward to sit through, knowing that the original source material was... different. 
but the remake is really well written. In fact, it's one of my favorite interpretations of the FNAF story. So I hope that you can just forget that the original game exists for a second. And please, try to enjoy. stay there until they learn that they aren't meant to do what they did. They're lucky that John's alive. They are lucky. But that doesn't mean they're above being taught a lesson. There was another one today. A younger girl, probably around 14, 15. She was causing even more problems around the establishment. I'm assuming she just thought she was too good for this. Fritz is onto something. I gave him an excuse when I left the back room. I could tell for now that satisfied him, but I need to start thinking Peter's about just alternatives. Wrong. He wants to keep this company running despite everything. Does he know what happened to John? Does he know what happened to everyone? This place, this company, all that it brings is, is pain and misery. But he doesn't get that. All he wants to do is keep the place running. And I don't even know what for. There's a birthday today. There's going to be another incident. Someone is going to get hurt at another fast bear location. Peter can't ignore it for much longer. John, I know you're listening, so listen well.
everything I think I really am. Find it and put an end to it. It's the only way, John. It's the only way. So night 10 is the final boss fight of Dermidibus, and I can't pretend it isn't one of my favorite boss fights of any FNAF fan game. Actually, probably one of my favorite boss fights in any FNAF game in general. When it comes to the mechanics, the night introduces us to a brand new element, the vents. The three vents can be locked, which delays Garvey's progress, which of course leads us to the main thread itself, Garvey, aka Springtrap, aka the purple guy. I've already said before how much I enjoy Garvey's rewrite as a genuinely interesting antagonist, but I can't stress enough how much this last night helps with my perspective of the character. He can appear at basically every place in your office, and will do so continuously until the night is over. Sometimes he'll laugh and depending where the audio comes from, that means he's sitting at the door or in the roof. To get him to leave, you stare at him until he slowly moves away. However, other times he'll crawl into the vents, making loud clanking noises as he does so. This is actually the main and most difficult part of the night. Remember when I told you to close the vents to delay him? Well, when he's on the vents, a small red dot will appear on the camera footage, and so you can see which vent he's coming from. Then you close the vents, delay him, and move to the other side of your desk to confront him. This seems easy, but it's actually pretty challenging, and it's all because the sheer speed he can go from one vent to the other. If you get two vent attacks in a row, you barely have enough time to see which vent he's attacking from, clicking to delay him and getting back to the other side of your desk in time to stare at him. And about that, you can't just arrive there at the same time as he does, you need to get there before he enters your office to catch him in the act. If you don't, he'll stop for a second but runs over and kills you anyway. It's really hard to talk about this night's lore because my personal favorite element, every hour or so, Garvey will speak to John as the night goes on, growing louder and louder as he slowly realizes you are defeating him. It's a very, very, very cool detail, and even if you don't really care much for the lore, at later parts of the night he gets so loud that you have to pay attention attention a lot to know where he is. It's a really, really well-executed final challenge that not only ties the bow nicely on the story of the remaster, but is also an experience that almost can't be talked about. So you know what, I'll just do the next best thing. I will show you all the relevant parts of the night, subtitle all I can and let you see for yourself, including how I was feeling at the time as I was defeating Garvey for the first time after many failed attempts. That being said, enjoy the show. Hi there. We are doing a lot of time here. This night. It's very door heavy this night. Is that your favorite door? Oh. 
It's very door heavy this night. It's very door heavy. You clip through the wall so hard. Oh, half time there, half time. I have time. Going through a lot of shit. Don't scream. Or if you're gonna scream, at least scream while you're visible. Now he's gonna scream at the top of his lungs. It's gonna be hard to understand where he is. I fucked up. I fucked up. Got it. The bad or good ending? Bad ending? How do I get the good ending? And there it is. Night 10. 
finished, and the main story of Dermidibus is officially over. But of course, as you saw, I did get the bad ending, and well, there are other things we can do to unlock the good ending. And actually, you may have seen some footage from it already, so you know what? Let's continue to Night 11, aka Nightmare Night. So, first of all, as I'm writing this, I noticed that a big update was made to the game. I don't think this contradicts anything I've said before in the video, but if it does, then a uh, oopsie daisy. Anyways, Night 11 or Nightmare Night is exactly what you'd expect. The hardest possible version of the main gameplay cycle that we've experienced from Night 1 to Night 9. Notable things that are unique to this night are the sound effects that will play during the night in order to distract you from your main objective, not unlike Garvey talking during Night 10, and the fact that the window behind you is broken now. It's really only cosmetic and doesn't really change anything mechanic-wise, but it's actually a pretty neat detail that they did not need to do, but adds to the general vibe of the night. To be honest, Nightmare Night is probably one of the least interesting things I can show you from the post credit section of the game, so I'll just move on to something that you've actually seen before, Cardboard Theater. John, this isn't purgatory. This is the court, and I'm fucking ballin'! Anyway, that's the actual voice actor for Garvey, by the way. Yeah, he followed me on Twitter, and I thought, what's the funniest thing I can make him say in the Garvey voice? And you know what? That was that. And it was really cool of the guy to provide me some voice lines. He did not have to, but it was really cool that he did. Again, if you're watching this, fucking thank you, man. That's amazing, honestly. <laughs> anyway, let's actually continue with the video now. Alright, so Cardboard Theater. Let's actually take some time with this one. Cardboard Theater is basically a playable recreation of the lore tapes that you've listened to before, hence why I used them in the segment earlier. But I think it's still important to go over some elements that feel important to mention. Just start with the one negative I have about this night, so we can just move on and go to all the positives. After an introduction to Cardboard Garvey and seeing someone get 1987 Markiplier style, we get to the first and last major hurdle of the night. This girl. Now, I don't know if this is gonna be fixed in a future update or if it's just meant to be like this, but how it is now, you need to get this girl over to Chica and stuff her inside. 
That's the main objective. But to do so, you need to repeatedly spam the spacebar in order to slowly move her forward. However, the amount you need to spam to keep her at bay is actually insane. It got to the point where I needed to use an auto-clicker to do it for me, and even the auto-clicker was struggling to beat it. I'm not even kidding. For context, here's all the attempts I had to do just to get over this night. And let me remind you, most of these are using an auto-clicker that spams space for me, which kind of insane. I think it's rude to just criticize a game but not give an actual fix, so let me just say it. Make it so you just have to hold the spacebar to drag her. Would it make the night a lot easier? I mean, yeah, but to be honest, this night is more of a story-related thing than an actual challenge, so you know, make it easy on purpose. Make it just an experience. I think for me the most confusing part is right after this, you have to do the same before a kid and stuff him inside of Bonnie, but this time you can just hold space. Actually, for all the other kids during the whole minigame, you can just hold space. So the first one is literally the only one where you need to spam. Look, I know that this issue was in the original game as well, but to be honest, it shouldn't have been carried over. I mean, they could have just fixed it. But you know what? Getting past that, the night goes smoothly, and it's a great experience. First, we capture the girl that we've mentioned and stuff her inside Chica. Then we capture the spoil, learn to sprint, and stuff him inside of Bonnie. Then you see Garvey come back, now with his trademark golden rabbit suit, and you you already know how this plays out. The kids follow him into the back rooms and stabby stab stab on all of them. Wait, is that- why is that- why is that kid dressed like Nico from one show? Then we leave the back room and uh oh, Fritz found the body, so you know, you just kinda stab him a little bit more, and then you place him inside of Cake Bear and go on your way. After that, you find two more kids to kill and they're twins. How fun. Actually, it's a great time to talk about one of the cool things about this night. Remember when we talked about the extras and how they have information about every character? Well, this information includes the way they died. So now, during Carver Theater, you have to pay attention to that information and make sure their death is exactly like what happened in real life. For example, BB and JJ are said to have starved to death in the back rooms of the pizzeria. So instead of killing them, this time you just need to leave them in the room and then come back later when they're dead. Is it much gameplay-wise? Uh, not really but is it something that actually works building the story in a fun way? Hell yeah! And you finally walk a bit more and find the key. Yeah, the same key that Peter was talking about in the main nights of the game. You walk up to it and, uh, unlock your mouse. Huh, why would that be? Oh! Oh, that's why. Okay. Let me explain. During the night, a timer shows up at the top of your screen, and any time this timer reaches zero, you get attacked by Havoc Puppet and sent back to the title screen. Basically, no matter what you do during the night, you won't have time to do everything before the timer runs out. But who said it had to run out? Since your mouse unlocks when you pick up the key, just go over to the timer and stop it yourself, in order to be able to continue the rest of the night. Anyway, you know what happens from here, right? You see what happened to Peter, get springlocked, chase John around the FNAF 3 office, and finally burned down with the pizzeria. And well, at this point you're familiar with the rest, right? You've kinda spent 11 nights here already, so, you know. With that done, let's continue to night twe- Uh... What? <laughs> well, I did already install an auto-clicker, and well... No one's looking, so uh... You know, maybe we can just uh...
Alright, so night 12, the final night of the game. For real this time. After this point, all the game has to offer is the extras menu and custom night, which I won't go over because, well, it's custom night, not much I can say about that. From what I've seen, if you complete the custom night, it gives you like a cake in the main menu, which is a pretty cool addition, but again, not something I'd personally go for, and again, not very important for the sake of the video. Now, getting back on track, Night 12 is based on the game Insanity, another game by the creator of the original Dermidibus, and that's the exact reason why I will not be mentioning Insanity ever again. First thing I noticed with Night 12 is how much of an upgrade it is visually. I didn't really mention the comparison between the original and the remaster, first of all because I do not want to touch the original, that game can burn in hell, but also because the remaster is just better in every way. This is literally the definitive version to experience this game, no questions asked. But I did want to mention it now because wow, just compare the two. This is so pretty, it's almost insane how pretty it is. Maybe I just got used to the more dirty FNAF 3 look of the game, but seeing a normal FNAF style pizzeria just genuinely is so refreshing and a great final way to finish the game. Now, there's only two animatronics this night, Havoc Puppet and Am I Real, but none of them play like they used to in the previous nights. First of all, this game has a battery, but it isn't like the FNAF 1 style battery that you've grown accustomed to, it's more of a short term battery that recharges every few seconds when not being used. Whenever this battery completely goes out, the entire pizzeria loses power and you'll be left in the dark while we wait for it to recharge. Just based on this, it's such an anxiety inducing thing to be left in the dark without a clue what's happening. For the cameras, you have a few cameras where Havoc Puppet can appear. You need to stare at him until he leaves the camera, which takes you basically all of your battery usage to do. If you don't, Puppet will shut off your power and you'll end up dying to Am I Real, or I guess Cake Bear as it's called. Now Cake Bear is the main threat of the night. He starts off right in front of you and almost immediately leaves. Then, after he leaves, he'll periodically return to your office, and when he finally crouches down next to you to kill you, you need to open the cameras to make him disappear. Of course, because of your limited battery power and the fact you probably already wasted most of it if not all of it on Havoc Puppet, this is harder than it sounds. If you remember all the way at the start of the video on night 1, we saw someone in the dumpster behind the pizzeria, which we can clearly see is the same one as we are playing now. Wait a minute. So someone died here at this pizzeria before any of the events with Garvey happened. I'll say it again, this is the final challenge of the game, and to be honest, this is a pretty unique one. It's very rewarding, especially when you know that by finishing this night you'll be completing the game for good with a final cutscene that will definitely make a welcome surprise for any FNAF fan. Especially those of you who remember a certain still unexplained mystery from FNAF 4. This has been a great time, and I've had a great time, but I guess all things have to come to an end, including this night and the game. The good ending this time. Which kinda makes me think, isn't this kinda what the remaster devs did? The dev team kinda made it so Dormitibus itself could have a good ending. They managed to completely fix the legacy of this once horrible game who was tainted by the actions of its creator. They gave the game a good ending. But I'm rambling, I'll just let you experience the good ending for yourself. Then I'll give my final thoughts on the game. See you in a bit. Actually, about that, uh, remember when I said this was the last night of the game? Yeah, that was a complete fucking lie. Apparently there's a whole nother minigame that I just haven't talked about because I didn't know it existed. And it all starts by pressing the word CLOCK into the Night 12 final screen. I tried to do this for the video, but I'll be honest, it doesn't really have to do with Dermidibus as much as it just has to do with other projects from the development team. It's this whole ARG thing that even gives you another executable file with a game in it, and I'm not gonna be talking about any of those in this video because it's just not the point of the video I'm making, but it is something that I really haven't seen anyone else explore on YouTube, so you know what? If someone out there wants to explore it, 
Feel free, be the first person ever to explore the mysteries of your Midibus Remastered. But I do have to say, this does play into the things I've said before about the development team really caring about this project and putting all their work and effort into it. Yeah, I mean, they created a whole other story just for a secret thing that not a lot of people will even find. But I'll leave all the mystery solving to you. Let's get back on track. Animatronic Pizzeria. After a dead woman was found in a dumpster behind Cake Bear's Pizza Palace, the restaurant was closed down for good. If it is ever going to open again, it is currently unknown. However, CEO Alex Wright said that he has no plans and is considering selling the brand to a new company named Fazbear Entertainment. It was later revealed by authorities that the body was of Julie Wright, wife of Alex Wright. This information made the CEO distraught at the news, giving more reason to simply sell off the brand to the new company. Animatronic Pizzeria opening its doors. Recently, Fred Bear's Family Diner opened its doors for a test run, and as of now, continues to bring delight and joy to the hearts of children in town due to their massive success with a much higher budget and many improvements than the original Cake Bear's place had. We would highly recommend a visit for the whole family if you haven't already. It was going so well. The Fred Bear's establishment in town was recently closed due to a malfunction with the popular animatronic Fred Bear, which resulted in a critically injured child. The original CEO Alex Wright was put on charges for safety violations. It was later revealed that the one missing child had been found in a dumpster at Fred Bear's family diner, adding up the charges against Alex Wright for murder in the second degree and first degree for his wife Julie Wright. Fazbear Entertainment did not condone such unsafe actions and promised the return with a much better investment in the franchise itself, making a new location and bringing in new employees to reduce the risk of such an accident ever occurring again. It's like a curse. The new Freddy Jr.'s Pizzeria establishment was closed after yet another incident involving a new animatronic. The employee by the name of Jeremy Fitzgerald died shortly thereafter as he was being transported to the nearby hospital. Customers also had filed complaints about an awful odor seemingly coming from the parts and service room, including the bathroom vents. Fritz Smith was arrested and was promptly fired for tampering with the electronics, facing a charge of murder in the first degree. The CEO has decided to take a break for now and is cooperating with the authorities to find the killer. Rotting corpses found inside animatronic performers. The newly renovated Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria was shut down after a year of its first opening, as four missing children from Fred Bears were found inside of the animatronics that were performing right on the stage, all dead and rotting away with a foul smell. The customer complaints were filed about the smells, which turns out to be the missing children inside the characters. With the killer still on the loose, Alex Wright has had charges dropped for the second degree murder, as evidence suggests that the person who killed the missing child is also responsible for the death of the four other children. Breaking news! Animatronic Pizzeria Troubles coming to an end. After 11 years of mysterious happenings at Freddy's, 
that the franchise is now at a close, as the CEO, Peter Wright, and the child were both found dead at the Freddy Fazbear's Pizzeria. One year later, to find the remains of Fred Smith shoved into a vent while inside of the suit of Cake Bear, the original animatronic. Fazbear Entertainment has lost all interest in the brand and has officially apologized, giving an undisclosed amount of payment for those affected by the tragedies over the years since Threadbears. The police was able to find a potential killer that was going by the name of Garvey Wright, the adopted son of the Wright family, with Alex having owned Cake Bear since 1979. According to the local chief, Garvey has, quote, avoided all contact with the police, was shown visibly shaking at times, and refused to give information about the whereabouts of his younger brother, John Wright, thus making him highly suspicious of the murders. The police found John to be in the family's original home, with Alex Wright, who recently finished serving a sentence. They have yet to find the killer, as he disappeared shortly after June 1993, never to be seen again. Alright, so it's finally time for me to express my final thoughts on the game, and what can I say? It's great. Not only does it fix the game in a lore sense, which was required, but also just fixes it in general by improving the entire experience, not only visually but mechanically, which was not required, although it's very appreciated. I did night 1 to night 10 in about a day, which took me about 4 hours, and had 3 more hours of gameplay the next day to complete night 10 to night 12, and of course all the other extras. So basically this completely free game that you can download right now will give you about 7 hours of content, and that's assuming you are just doing the main story like me and aren't going to like sink your teeth into the customite or the ARG side content. I think I've made it clear with how I formatted the video that the main part of the game that I was excited to talk about was the story, and I hope that with leaving in the phone calls and editing together visuals for the tapes, I help with this effect. I'm sure part of me is praising the story a bit too much, but it's hard not to when you compare it to the original. In fact, it's hard to compare anything in this game to the original because these are practically different games. It's like eating a rotten piece of meat off a trash bin and then eating at a 5 star restaurant. Yeah, they're both the same meal, technically, but you can't really compare the two without sounding insane. I think the voice acting is the main game changer for me. Not only the obvious changes to Garvey, showing how one of the voices from the original game can grow and develop their craft, creating a much more rewarding and well-written story when they are given the freedom to do so. But also the phone guy, which really shows how important that one phone call is to creating a valuable experience in the game. Especially when you consider that in most of these games, it's the first voice you ever listen to and is what sets the mood for the entire game afterward. This is why I left the voice lines for these two mostly untouched. Other than, of course, some cutting around just to save on the video's duration. I felt like it's important to show how much of an impact the voice performance can have on a game, especially when it's the main vehicle for the story. With other projects that I've been excited about either being cancelled or delayed this year, it's refreshing to see a game that not only did what it set out to do, but did it in a pitch-perfect way, nailing and delivering an experience that is definitely worth playing. This video went over the entire game, so I understand there's at least a portion of you that will decide to just watch this instead of playing for yourself, but I do urge you to reconsider, as I actually left a surprising amount of stuff untouched in this video. And even if I didn't, there's nothing like experiencing the game for yourself. The story really sinks in deeper once you've emerged yourself in the game's purgatory. Now, as for my video, uh, there's plenty I could've done better, don't get me wrong, but most of this is attributed to the fact that I haven't done a video like this before, but this topic was important to me, so I needed to take the time to do it. The original game was released five years ago. That would make me 14 at the time, and now I get to re-experience those memories, not with an awful game that would put a shit green color on my roast into glasses, but with a remaster that keeps the magic alive and lets me imagine the world where the original never existed. I did make a big fuss about it earlier because I know most of those who will even watch this video already know the original and were just waiting to see my parade crash and burn as soon as I talked about the story. Well, joke's on you. If you're listening to this, I got you to listen to me hyperfix on a game I like for about a whole hour. 
And you probably know this, but there's a lot of other videos that are detailing the drama with Dermidibus, you don't need to hear it again from me. This is solely a positive video about the remaster where we do not touch the original, at least not too much. That being said, I think I already said everything I needed to all throughout the video's duration. So let's just give a quick round of applause to the whole dev team that made this experience possible. And special thanks again to the voice of Garvey for participating in the video. Again, this game is not just a random game for me, it's a nostalgic trip down memory lane. So having someone from that original memory participate in this video is just insane to me. Please check all of these creators out, and maybe while you're there, uh, play the game for yourself, give it a whirl. That being said, I should probably play this last tape, shouldn't I? Yeah, there's one last tape. Wanna hear it? Let's do it. This has been Ken, and this was my analysis on Dermidibus Remastered. John, what the fuck is a kind, and why did they spend a full hour talking about our life? <laughs> I can't.